Okay, I know people are still streaming in. I'll go ahead and welcome you all. Hello, my name is Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Life Without Children stories. You can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A. The Q&A can be found along the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcript option, which is also along the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Roddy Doyle was born in Dublin and is the author of 11 acclaimed novels, including The Commitments, The Van, which was a finalist for the Booker Prize, Patty Clark, Ha Ha Ha, winner of the Booker Prize, and most recently, Love. Doyle was, has also written several collections of stories and several works for children and young adults. Nula O'Connor, was born in Dublin and is a graduate of Trinity College. She has won many prizes for her short fiction, including the Short Story Prize in the UK and Ireland's Francis McManus Award. She's the editor of Flash Easing Splunk. Her most recent book is Nora, a love story of Nora and James Joyce. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the screen over to you too. Welcome, thank you for being here. Thank Thanks you. a million. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, so I'm going to do a little introduction of Roddy, too. Um, and just to <laughs> say he's the author of 12 novels, in fact. <laughs> um, and as we know, Paddy Clark, ha ha ha, won the Booker Prize in 93. But he's also a screenwriter, playwright uh, and the co-founder of Fighting Words, which is a writing charity set up to help and encourage children throughout Ireland with their creativity. Um, so a brilliant thing to do. Um, we're here today to talk about Life Without Children and happy American Publication Day, Roddy. Uh, it's published by Viking Penguin today. I hope you did something nice, had a nice cake with your tea or something, whatever it is you like to do. Um, so the stories in Life Without Children, they were written in the lead up to the pandemic and during the pandemic. So they mm -hmm. really are a chronicle of those times with all of the language and science we had to learn and adapt to. Um, I noticed the word droplets as I read the collection yeah. starting to become very ominous indeed. Yeah. So I'm wondering how and why did writing a set of stories fit with the madness that was go going on outside of our doors? Well, um, I was um, in March, 2020, you know, two years ago, I had a, I had a nice year laid out in front of me. You know, I was in the UK going from event to event. I'd been to London. I'd been to Manchester, been to Edinburgh. I was in Newcastle um, and I was doing a, about five different events throughout Ireland then, you know. I had three stage shows planned during the year. I didn't plan them myself, but plays I'd written, mm. uh, two going on tour and one then new one opening in Dublin. And uh, I was working on a novel and had a novel about to be published. But in the space of a couple of weeks, like when, when the lockdown started, all that fell away. Uh, one of the shows was immediately cancelled, two were postponed. Hopefully I'll see them later this year. The publication of the novel was shoved back six months, and the, the hope being that all would be back to normal in six months. And I sat down to write the novel when I got home to Ireland and began to get the hang of what living in a lockdown was like. And I opened it up. I hadn't written much, luckily, but I opened it up and it made no sense, you know, because the present day it was set in didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want to haul in the uh, the, the, the pandemic at that stage. I don't think we were even using the word pandemic casually at that sense, you know, mm -hmm. and um, because I didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen, you know, didn't know how long it was going to last. The optimists were saying, oh, I'll be grand by the summer, you know, 
the pessimists were saying it's the end of the world. And um, I tend to go somewhere in the middle of that, which was you know, 30 years or so we'd be back to normal. You know? mm-hmm. So the, the novel, I just didn't see it working. And as, as we went on, then I realized, you know, there's no point in just waiting and um, it's going to be hard to avoid this thing because uh, already it felt like something that is shaping our lives and that people of my age and younger and certainly older for the rest of our lives is going to be pre and post pandemic, you know. So I was wondering, what will I do? Um, and I'm usually not lost for an idea, you know. Uh, finding a shape for it is the problem, but I'm usually not lost for an idea, but I hadn't a clue. But then the sensations I'd felt when I was in Newcastle, uh, Britain, for American people um, listening or watching, uh, Ireland went into lockdown much sooner than the UK did. So I was in the UK, very much an Irish person, and I began to feel really far from home. Because, and I normally don't feel that when I'm in the north of England because it's very, very, it's very like Dublin in many ways. But I was looking at the newspapers online, the Irish newspapers, talking to family. They were telling me about social distance and, you know, get hand sanitizer, I was told. Couldn't find it anywhere in the UK. Uh, I was looking at the yellow and black signs, you know, that were becoming the norm in supermarkets and everywhere, really, about keeping social distance. Not a sign of any of them in Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, Theatres were shut. Cinemas were shut, the pubs were about to shut, the schools were shut um, in Ireland. And I was uh, on a Friday night in Newcastle and Tyne, it, upon Tyne. It was, you know, Stag and Hen Central. Mm-hmm. And I got, into a, I got into an elevator at the ho- in the hotel I was staying in, and it was full of men who were at a stag party, men from Northern Ireland. They were all wearing the, what I call Hawaii Five-O shirts. And they were all on the verge of getting very drunk. It seemed like, you know, great fun, but it just looked dangerous. Not because it was a group of men getting drunk, but because they were all in close proximity to each other. They were inhaling and exhaling. You know? And I didn't want to be in the elevator. And I never felt that way before, you know. And I was kind of holding my breath till the doors opened and I could get outside the door and breathe North Sea air safely. And my head was full of this when I got home to Ireland, you know, and I thought, well, maybe there's a story in it. So I started writing the story that became the title story, Life, Life Without Children. And I realized then that um, I can write this story because it only is a moment in this man's life. Now, he's looking back, but it's a moment in this li- man's life. I'm not going to follow him into the next day and the next and the next because I don't know what's going to happen, you know. Um, if we go right back to the beginning, the start of the lockdown, going to the supermarket was like it was like going up the Amazon. There was no guarantee that the person whose turn it was to go to the supermarket was ever going to come back, you know, or if, if they did come back, that they weren't going to be carrying the lethal disease. And, you know, it was it was genuinely frightening. Yeah. So as I wrote that story, I began to think of another one. And I thought, yeah, this is what I'll do. I'll write short stories. So quite soon on, then I got in touch with my publisher and my agents and suggested there might be a gang of stories here. And they were very enthusiastic. So that gave me a goal and the impetus. Because So the the short answer to the question that you asked about three days ago (laughs) is um, (laughs) I wrote the short stories because there was nothing else I could do, really. You know? Yeah. It's funny, isn't it, how for a nation of mavericks, how obedient we became very quickly oh, yeah. with our sanitizer and our masks. I think that's always a strange thing about us that yeah. we're all half mad, but we're also quite willing to do things to pull together for the good of everyone, which I thought well, was a good thing. I thought it was great. And because, you know, I think there was, a, I think we all got it, but you know, when you put on a mask, it's not just to protect yourself, it's to protect everybody else. That's the whole point. And the same with the, the vaccine, you know, um, by inoculate by having yourself inoculated, you're protecting other people. That's, and I think people kind of got that. There is a, you know, as you know, you said, there's a big history. Of, there's a big vaccine history in 20th century Ireland. You know, the eradication of uh, diseases that killed 
vast amounts of people in Ireland. So um, I think maybe the cultural attitude was different. But yeah, it it I think it does baffle people how, you know, a group of people who kind of present themselves as wild and boisterous and disobedient and all the, you know, all the jolly things in life. Actually, when it came to queuing up, <laughs> you know, quite politely and taking the vaccine and, you know, just doing the proper thing that we, yeah. you know, 95% of us did it. I think so, but I think Irish people like a learning experience and we were nearly enjoying ourselves learning all the new stuff, you know. But there is a sense yeah. that, you know, writing of the moment work is quite courageous. It's it's a risk because there's no cooling off period. Yeah. You know, so where would you stand on sort of the getting things right aspect of it? Do you fear like is it of personal importance to you to get it right? You know, there's a kind of a sensitivity that writers have at just a sort yeah. of a, I mean, they have to have in order to write. Yeah. Did that occur to you? The the sort of, wow, I'm writing about something that's happening now. It's very courageous in a way. Um, I don't know. The word courageous didn't flit across the top of my head when I was writing. There's a risk, all right, you know. Um, and I was reading and hearing that, oh, people won't want to read about the pandemic. And I really didn't care, yeah. you know. I really didn't care. That, that, that wasn't the point. I, you know, I wasn't sitting down hoping this this will be gone, girl. You know, or yeah. um, you know, bestsellers wasn't what I was thinking about. And I think in terms of getting it right, I suppose it's there's there's such a thing I think as creative truth or through you know a truth inside the covers of a book or inside a short story, and. Um, I suppose if you write something that sees the light of day uh, a few months into an event like this, and then, you know, you read it sometime, maybe two years later, and it feels a bit dated, you know, grand. Does it yeah. matter? You know, no, it, you know it's of um, its time. That's what's important. Yeah. yeah. And you want, you know, I, I'd like to think that the people in the books are kind of genuinely real characters. So um, they're not putting on spacesuits and, you know, and they're not, it, it doesn't really matter, you know, in terms of these stories, it doesn't really matter if Russia invades the Ukraine. Do you know what I mean? So I don't have to wait to see what happens there. And I don't think, because I didn't look, I didn't project any characters into the near future. If to see, you know, and it wasn't, there was no, there's no story where they come out the door and say, well, that was that. It's all over now, lads. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's none of that. So it's all confined within the time that I was writing each story. So uh, I suppose um, no is the short answer to the Yeah, to the no, it's interesting because even when I was reading them, it was like, oh, yeah, I remember the yellow tape was a frightening thing. Remember all these mm. things were frightening and then how quickly yeah. we just wrote in with it all yeah yeah. Um, yeah yeah and you're right about the immediacy thing like it doesn't matter that the short story has parameters and that's the beauty of it it's in and of itself it's a reflection of the writer as the writer but also the yeah. time all i um, wanted uh, you know when you write a short story i think you, you're hoping one one is hoping that um the reader will read it in one go <laughs> really that's as much as I'd ask, you know. I won't be looking around and, you know, if I see somebody um, stopping halfway through, I won't be, you know, slapping them on the back of the head and telling them to finish it. But um, that's, you know, really, you hope that people, it, a story would be gripping enough for people to read it. And if it's gripping enough, it seems to me there's a certain truth and that, that'll do. Yeah. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's a one gulp and it's down experience. Yeah. And then yeah. hopefully a little sort of a digesting period that the reader sits and thinks about it and then goes on to another one. They're not like a, they're not like a packet of biscuits that you're scoffing down. You sort of take them no. one at a time. Posh biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kafka said short stories are the places where you can follow your intense obsessions mercilessly, which is a quote I love. So what would you say are the intense obsessions for you in general with the short story? This collection, maybe uh, there are some obvious patterns and themes in it. Apart at all from the pandemic, the men in it seem to mm. me to be slightly at sea. Could you talk about yes. that? 
Yeah, they're all um, they're all of a certain age. Um, I feel I know them quite well. <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all of a certain age. I suppose you know you were talking about uh, the, the issue about well, we were talking about the issue about whether. The stories are, you know, is it too soon to be writing fiction about the pandemic and, you know, all this stuff that's going on at the moment? And I think there's a certain quality about the men that they've reached a point in their lives when their self-definition is no longer, say, father or parent. And some of them, it's not even whatever they do for a living or did for a living. So they're at that point where they are having to, if they choose, look at themselves anew, so to speak. And some of them aren't up to the job, you know? They just can't see past that phase in their lives. And I think, a lot, like, you know, from talking to men who've had children like myself, there was a phase, my children now are, none of them are, they're all adults. Um, none of them live in the house. Uh, they live in Dublin, luckily, but none of them live in the house. And they don't need me. Um, I don't have to ferry them around the place. Uh, they don't need advice. Don't want it, I hope. Um, I wouldn't be the one to ask. <laughs> I'd be the last person <laughs> to ask for advice anyway. But and um, I thought I'd gone through that maybe 10 years ago, that sense of redundancy, mm -hmm. uh, when your children are much more independent than they used to be. But actually, then there's another phase where you don't feel redundant anymore, but there's nothing, nothing has even replaced the redundancy, if, if, if this makes sense. And um, in, in one of the stories, for example, I think the one called um, Worms, uh, the main male character, and to a degree his, uh, his wife, kind of rediscovered themselves and rediscover each other. Quite surprised, that the, and they're quite surprised that this happens. They've, I suppose, been politely moving around each other in the house, um, probably doing a, the happy slalom for about 30 years as the children were reared. And they continued doing it, even though there was no one else in the house. And because they're locked into the house, perforce, they're, they're, they're um, almost introduced to each other. Yeah. And that's probably the happiest story in the collection, really, because it's a love story in some ways, bizarre love story. Because they do actually, in a way, fall in love with each other. And there's another character in another story, the Charger, Mick. Mick. And Mick, his self-belief is so low that he's utterly dependent on his wife. Completely and utterly dependent on his wife. And this particular morning, he realises it in a bone-chillingly way because she has gone out the door uh, to have a, um, a visit to a hospital and he can't even get a grip on what it is that's wrong with her. He can't hold down the medical information and he's terrified that that glimpse he had of her getting into the back of a taxi earlier in the day is the last glimpse he'll have of his wife. It's bang in the middle of the first lockdown. People were genuinely frightened about going anywhere um, door handles were lethal, you know, do you remember? Um, she, he sees her wiping down the seat of the taxi before she'll climb into the taxi. So it, it, there are men like that in the book. Another man who doesn't have a name in the mask, or masks it's called, and the scaffolding of his life, getting up, going to work, working, coming home, getting ready for the next day is gone. And there's no joy for him in working from home because he's the only thing in the house. Yeah. You know, there's no uh, sourdough. You know what I mean? There's no bacon. Banana bread. <laughs> yeah. There's no trips down to the off-license to buy the vermouth for the risotto. You know? <laughs> there's none of that, you know. He's got absolutely nothing except himself and he's striding along trying to trying to stomp the anger in a way and he hates everything and he just feels so angry and doesn't know why and um 
he makes a discovery towards the end of the story and he does something mad and brilliant at the end of the story. So yeah, the, 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 um, the stories are populated by, to a degree, lost men trying to find the door, trying to wait, find, trying not to find the way out, but trying to find the way back in, I suspect, really, which is, I suppose, a bit ironic since they're locked in. You would have thought they were trying to get out, but in fact, in some ways, they're trying to get in. Yeah, but there's a lot of, you're very tender with them as well. Like poor Mick now in the charger, mm. like you, you're kind of wondering as the reader, oh, is this anxiety induced by the pandemic or does he have maybe early onset dementia? He seems to be hallucinating at one point. Is he yeah, just I think it's just, I think everything was intensified by the lockdown. Yeah. You know, those of us who, those of us who are prone to, to a melancholy, you know, it probably dumped itself on us that bit more heavily. Yeah. Uh, so I think there was a lot of self-examination, you know, um, a lot of silence. And then you get people saying, oh, it's not brilliant. We can hear the birds. But people, I think there are people who hear the silence, but don't hear the birds. Yes, you know? yes, exactly. And I feel, it's nice that you said the word tender, because I did feel that in a way, my job was to try and do the best for these men, you know, not to write them off as silly, useless men. I don't know if you listen to radio ads much, you know, but they're populated by idiotic men. I'm always screaming at the radio about this. Oh, Stupid it dad. annoys me so much. Yeah, me yeah. the television as well, but it seems yeah. to be worse than the radio. It's idiotic, stupid men <laughs> who can't do anything and they're rescued by the, the cranky partner, you know. It Almost doesn't a do. mother figure, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, and it's, it's, it's just awful in a way. So I wanted to, you know, do right by them in a way. And because I, I talk, you know, at heart, it's much more interesting, you know. Yeah. Um, and I just felt, yeah, just, just, you know, if ever there was a time for gentleness, <laughs> now's the time, really. Yeah, isn't it, I have know? to say, I felt great compassion for all of them. Oh, and thank you. Um, mm. You know, because things are hard for everyone. That's the nature yeah. of the short story. But things yeah. are hard for these men. They may yet get better. They may not. They do. Their women seem better able to cope with life and the world in general. They're more pragmatic as people. Yeah, I think. Um, my observation, you know, I'm not saying this is, you know, this is fact, but my observation would be that women roll much better in a way in crisis. They're not as stuck to a definition, a couple of adjectives, you know. Um, even when I was a young man working in a, a school, a high school in the middle of a working class area of Dublin, when the unemployment rate was phenomenally high and the Celtic Tiger and the good times that came with them were, you know, not even a dream, um, women managed, or struck me as they managed much better. Um, the black economy, for example, was populated by women. They did their work at home and then they went to work in a way that the men didn't. When the men were unemployed, the men were unemployed, you know, but the women yeah. might have been officially unemployed, but they weren't, you know. And it struck me that they always, and I think in a way, it's a bit of a cliche as well that, you know, women can have four things on the hob where the man can only do it one thing at a time. And we're kind of trained to think that way. Yeah. But I think actually men who cook realize, well, that's not true. <laughs> but in a way, the same, we're, we're, all, we're all trained to comply in a certain way, you know. And I think what I was trying to do in a way was um, I just, you know, do justice to the men in the stories, I suppose, without making them paragons or anything like that but some of them do grab the opportunity you know they do they do try to make the most of what's there which isn't very much but they do really try to make the most of it oh they you know, certainly do and a lot of the time they use humor to do that yeah so they'll they'll puncture a situation by saying something funny that mm. they know whoever's mm. with them will enjoy yeah. or they you know they give the bit of advice to the child yeah. whether they want it or not and, and i well, love that you know thank you i wrote for a while a column in for the irish independent newspaper called charlie savage i did it for about three years 
It was a weekly thing where, you know, it was the 800 words written by this middle-aged man, grandfather of very young little children yeah. uh, or one little grandchild. Um, and he's he's kind of guy, he's, he's, he's a bit lost in the world, recently retired, wandering, looking at things, comes out with the, the, the odd wise thing. But um, there, were, there were categories of people who really responded very, very well to Charlie Savage. There were kind of people of his age who really enjoyed it. And then the thing that surprised me was young women, you know, mm -hmm. they really, really liked it. And I was a bit baffled by it because it wasn't their world. It wasn't their language in ways. But what they really liked about it is that they, it all reminds me of my dad. He's exactly like my dad. And um, so I think what I was trying to do with some of those stories is to make those men into that dad figure that... Um, a lot of daughters love and who adored our daughters. And I think a big part of that is the dad's sense of humor, you know? So I think uh, the lesson when I was doing Charlie Savage is that, you know, you don't write for a particular person. It's surprising sometimes what, who um, gets something out of something that you write, you know? Yeah. You drive I, I, just, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, you drive oh, yourself mad trying to decide who your reader is, wouldn't oh you? Oh, Christ, yeah. Well, you're always going to be wrong anyway. Yeah, exactly. I think that sort of <laughs> older man figure is like a... He's like the person we want to keep old-fashioned while we try and drag him into the 21st century, but there's yeah. safety in him. You know, he's a safe space. There's a lot of kindness, yeah. I think, in those older men, and there's a lot of kindness in this book. I'm thinking of the Five Lamps story, the one that you end uh -huh. with, where the man from Longford is in Dublin, looking for his son and he experiences kindness from unexpected sources. So there's a yes. woman who's going to methadone maintenance down near Amien Street Station. There's a, an immigrant worker who's serving coffee in an empty Houston station. Mm -hmm. um, and he gets this kindness given to him and he's astonished by it. It's like yes. he's the, in Ireland, we say Kulchi is someone from the country who's not from the city mm. in Dublin. And he has a sort of a, an innate hostility to the city. And then he finds people being kind to him there and he changes his mind. And you see that, that change that we see in the short story that can be overt or very quiet in him. Mm -hmm. um, that was you... the, uh, the final story I wrote. And it was a strange one. I wanted it to have a kind of fairy tale quality to it. And I didn't know where it was going. Um, and then it struck me, well, he's walking by the five lamps, which, uh, you, you know, is a, well, it's a lamp with five, yeah. it's a structure with five lamps. <laughs> it's about a 20 minute walk from where I'm sitting at the moment. And it's a big, well, it's a big thing, full stop, but it's a big thing in my life. And I don't know how many, many times I've walked by it, been on the bus, driven by it, leaned against it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big famous thing. And I wonder how far, how many, how many people is he going to meet? And then it struck me, five. You know, and the five lamps, then, you know, light, glow, they're all going to give him a hand, so to speak. They're all going to be nice in a, in a time where he doesn't expect anything particularly nice from anything in this city. Anyway, he doesn't like it. He's hostile towards it. He doesn't trust it. He doesn't like Dubliners. But they're all these, you know. The home-born Dubliners, like the woman who outside the methadone clinic, and the man in the um, the bakery van, and then the the newer Dubliners, the young woman in the cafe, and um, um, oh, I forget now. But uh, they all um, they all just give him a, if you like, a tap on the shoulder as he makes his way trying to find his son. And I just wanted a kind of fairy tale quality to it. But what made it really difficult, I think it's a, in the words of Prince, a sign of the times, <laughs> was that I started that story in March 2021. Hmm. And I was only going back a year to the first days of the pandemic, March 2020. And it was incredibly hard to get that character, and, and, and it was get myself, my head, back to a time before we knew a lot of the vocabulary, before we were using, a lot, before we were wearing masks, before a lot of the things that became normal were normal. It was really, really hard. And in the normal run of things, and hopefully we get back to some sort of time when, 
going back a year is no big deal. Mm. What were you doing this time last year? Probably exactly what I'm doing now. But uh, the last two years of our lives, that's not true. It, uh, you know, uh, March 2021 is a very, hope, well, we're in February, but say February 2021 was a very, very different feel to mm. February 2022. And going right back to February 20, uh, 2020, when is it going to happen? Isn't it going to happen? Oh, it's happening. Uh, you know, there are three different, very, very different Februarys. And going back just the 12 months to the to the first February for, for one and the first March, for want of a better term, was incredibly difficult. I really have it was real stop, start, stop, start, and asking myself, did we use that phrase? You know, it, it, would he have known this at this stage? You know, so it was really quite difficult, but very satisfying. Yeah, it's that funny thing, isn't it? That sort of we were all arrested in a sense and, and had, had to learn new ways. And now we're still mm. trying to figure out what we're doing next. And I think that business of saying about the fairy tale like quality and you have the beats of the five kind people, you have the five lamps, you know, the, the short story lends itself, doesn't it, to that kind of innovation and play and experiment and yeah. doing things like that, that you can do in the novel and it might be fun for you, but it's it's. I think anyway, in the short story, it's kind of the reader notices it more because I don't think it would work in a novel, really, because you probably just what, what you'd be doing really is inflating what is really a good sized short story. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, I think it works in a short story because it doesn't outstay its welcome, you know, and it's of a short duration. Whereas if I and you know, the one or two of the stories I wrote where I, I would have been tempted to keep on going because, they, you know, one or two of them had the legs to be something a bit bigger, but I decided, no, no, I'll stick to what I think, what I believe I'm doing, which is short stories. But this one, I, again, you know, a man, you know, setting out on a, a journey to find something, you know, it's not the newest idea ever. you know, And um, so it could go on. I mean, other the, the, the epic poems have been written about that stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, great feature films and all sorts of things. But, it, it, you know, the way I saw it and the way I fashioned it was, no, it's definitely a short story. And if I'd, um, if I'd tried to make, and there, it, there is, a, as I said, a fairy tale fable quality to it. And if I tried to extend that and make a story, I, I would have, I'd make a novel out of it. I possibly would have been regretting it as I got into page 127 or something and thinking, yeah. oh, what will he do now? Will I make it seven people he meets or maybe nine or make it a clean baker's dozen, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I loved, so, tra loved travelling through the empty city with him yeah, on that yeah. journey, and that was fascinating too. Well, I wonder, would you, would you read an extract from one of the stories to give mm -hmm. people a flavor of the book. Yeah. Um, um, Nick and the Charger, I think you were thinking. The Charger, that. yes. Yeah. I'll just read a bit of the Charger. This is um, Mick. Uh, Mick in his bedroom, having seen his wife go away to hospital. And, and uh, you know, he's kind of almost like a child waiting at the window for her to come home. Mm -hmm. And his daughters are in the house somewhere. His, all his all his daughters, much to his delight at the time, came home for the pandemic. But he's not sure whether they, they have their own rules about lockdown. Basically, he's not sure where they are or what. Mm. But I'll, I'll just read two pages. It's 11 weeks. He thinks it's 11 weeks, maybe 12. Before that, before the lockdown, the virus had been in the news, but it had nothing to do with them. It was over in China. It was over in Italy. Then there was a case in Ireland. A case, not a man or a woman. The case got off a plane from Milan. The case was on a bus from the airport to, Boso to Bosaurus, then across the street to Connolly and onto the train, the Enterprise, to Belfast. They'd laughed, him and Mary, as they, as they listened. They'd, they've been saturated with information for months now, a solid chunk of the year, although it feels like much more than a year. The last of his aunties has died. He'll be getting some money once, whatever it is, her house is divided amongst the nieces and nephews. She told him at a wedding, he can't remember who was getting married, it wasn't him, that he'd be getting a few bob when she died. She'd been like Marlon Brando in The Godfather that day, the way she waved at the nephews and the nieces, calling them over, telling them the lucky news and warning them not to tell anyone else. 
Anyway, she's dead. Mick wasn't one of the ones selected to go to the funeral. He'd watched it on Mary's iPad. But the point is, he knows the virus killed the poor Elwyn, but he doesn't know how. After hours, probably days of experts and diagrams, he doesn't really get it. Mary knows, Mary understands, and the girls know, but not Mick the Thick. A persistent cough, sneezing, a fever, a headache, you're on your way. A bad heart, bad lungs, diabetes, too much weight, you're, you have a one-way ticket to ICU. That's his knowledge. It took him the first month to get into his head what, I see, what ICU stood for, exactly. He's stuck in a world he doesn't understand. He's being hard on himself. He knows as much as he needs to know. He won't pretend he's an, epidemiolo an epidemiologist like half the fucking agents he meets when he's out on his 2K walk. He's always hard on himself. He knows that, but it doesn't stop him. He'll get up and look closer at the charger and, and the bowl. The fragility of the world is the biggest shock. He doesn't think the last recession, the big one, was anything like this. It was bad, but fuck it, he could go for a pint. It was a different kind of social distancing. It was the fear that someone else, the, there was the fear when, someone, when someone's name came up on the screen as the phone rang. What does he fucking want? Questions were dangerous. Get-togethers were scary until you saw the faces on the men and women you were meeting. Mick knew one lad who definitely killed himself and another who probably had. His car had gone into a wall. This, though, this was so different. He can't see himself walking into a full room again. The heat, the sweat in the air, the steam, manoeuvring himself through bodies to get close enough to shout for a pint, putting his hands on the counter, picking up a wet glass, pulling open a packet of crisps, licking the salt off his fingers. It's not going to happen. He'll never stand in a pub again. He doesn't care. He's done, he's done something. He doesn't know what. Or maybe he hasn't done something, noticed something. Whatever he was, whatever he had, it's gone and he missed it going. The pubs can open in July, August, next year. He doesn't know, but he won't be there. He doesn't even joke about it. He can't. He's talking to no one. He's shut down. He doesn't know how, but something must have happened because his family, the women, want to kill him. If there are other candidates in the house, unless it's Mick and he can't remember. Oh, poor Mick. He's very hard on himself. Oh, he is, yeah. Yeah, but it just, you know, I'm, I'm not Mick, but I have been to a pub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it did happen. <laughs> yeah, bless him. I love mm. the way Mary restores him. <clears throat> yeah. You know, she's like yeah. his, um, his soft place to land or whatever you'd say. Yeah, and I um, suppose the question is, what does Mary see in him? You know, and I trust Mary. So now they're fictional characters. So I trust her. You know, Mick is hard on himself. There's more going on than he will actually ever accept. Yeah. But I love the kind of softness of him, too. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of the men in these stories have a lovely a sort of a beautiful softness, which is very, mm -hmm. it's very enjoyable to read. It's a beautiful collection to read. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm always interested in how other writers handle endings because they're so hard and they're so yeah. tricky. And your hope always is that they arrive to you as an in inevitable thing, that they just land, you know, that there's yeah, no yeah. work involved. Uh, <laughs> can you talk to me a bit about endings? Do you find them tricky? Do you run after them? Are you an organic writer or do you plan or what's how? Do oh, they I don't plan. I don't plan. I think if I had to plan, I'd never write, you know. I could never be an architect, for example. I could never plan the building ever. I, I make it up as I go along, so I plan as I go. And I, I, I suppose I could say now that I've written so many books and so many stories that I've learned in, that the ending will eventually make itself apparent. But I actually, I think, got that from the very beginning. I suppose when I wrote a book about a, a young bunch of people forming a band and the band was going to break up and that was my ending. And the challenge there was how to get there. Yeah. But it was still it was still tricky enough. And then the snapper, my second book, a young woman is having a baby and the baby was going to be the ending and the baby was going to be fine. So I didn't have to worry too much about the ending, but three years went into getting there. <laughs> yeah. You know, other books, I had no idea how, how they were going to end. And sometimes in at least three cases, I sat and I was writing and I realized I got to the end and I hadn't a clue 
earlier in the day that this was going to happen, that it was anywhere near it. But it just struck me, there, here's the place to stop. So it wasn't like a planned thing, you know, it was just, here's the place to stop. You know, this makes sense. If I go any further, it's just dragging it out, you know. Yeah, exactly. I can't recall any of the short stories that I wrote there, the 10, the 10 that are in the collection. I can't remember knowing how they were going to end in any case. Just a general tone, perhaps. Um, I knew that at the end of the charger, Mick was going to be anticipating his wife's return. And he, somehow or other, the day he's had, he's going to be a bit different, a bit fuller, a bit more uh, a bit more at ease yeah and, be, and he wants to be like that to help his wife to help mary when she comes in yeah and i more, think yeah. yeah but the other stories no i didn't really know how they were you know the, the story gone which is you know two it has really two narrators a man and a woman and she's decided that they this this the first days of the lockdown are her opportunity to escape to disappear literally and I knew that um, somehow or other they, 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 you know, the two parallel, the two parallel lines of their lives would uh, somehow or other stop being parallel, and there'd be a, a fleeting moment when they'd, they'd, they'd kind of glimpse each other and accept what has happened. And, yeah, that works very well, and, and yeah, all the I, endings work well. I'm always amazed, you know, when you hear that. I shouldn't be because I know how this works. You know, mm. that the ending kind of starts to become a feeling as you get towards it near it and then it it comes to you thank god yeah. it comes like yeah. but it's always it's always an anxiety though isn't it from the very beginning i mean you know when you sit to one of the one of the nice things about starting a novel is you know you're under no pressure to finish it really in most cases you can go at your own pace but yeah. the bloody ending is always there you know it seems yeah. to be always there it's like your first day at school and some guy sits down beside you and said, you know, what do you want to do when you go to college? You're only five. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ending sitting beside you, you know, how are you going to end this? You know, go yeah. away, go away. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember hearing um, Alistair MacLeod, the great Canadian mm. writer, saying that the ending of a story was a lighthouse towards which he traveled. And I was amazed yeah. by this because the, I have no lighthouse. It's more like a cave, no. you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd be a bit like yourself, you know. Yeah. I, I do think that that phrase "light at the end of the tunnel." I, I've always I, I like that because you know, there's um, I've been in tunnels where there's no light, and then suddenly yeah. there's a tiny, tiny, tiny glimpse, and even that tiny glimpse of light is um, very comforting. It is exactly. You know, it yeah. is comforting. Whereas a lighthouse, uh, oh, that's a big ask. I can't I imagine constructing a lighthouse. And then going back to 200 miles and then writing my way towards the lighthouse. It seems too big an ask. Well, it's, it's, uh, I suppose we all, have our, we all seem to have our version of the light in the dark. And, you know, the, the little glimpse of light is the, uh, to me, is the important thing. But I've never had a moment. I've never felt that um, when I get to an end of a story, I don't feel that there's a big door or a big window opens or a blind is lifted and there's a huge burst of light. I've never actually felt that at all. You just get to the end. <laughs> yeah, and that's the beauty of short stories, isn't it? Yeah. That they they sort of reveal themselves to you as the writer as you go along. And it doesn't have yeah. to be fireworks at the end. But, no. you know, leaving the reader yeah. guessing is perfectly OK. I wonder, um, yeah. we're, we're at a quarter of the hour already. I can't I can't believe it. I wonder if I might just look in here at the Q&A and see if we've any questions here that you might take. Yeah, um, oh. yeah like, happily. So this is something that's it's from Kyla Morris and she's asking about getting published, which is a very it's a very difficult thing to answer, mm. Roddy. But yeah. she's she's saying she's feeling despondent and losing faith mm. about getting published. And I suppose, Kyla, it depends whether you're trying to get a novel published or a short story and it's all to do with genre. But Roddy, have you any advice about working with that despondency and, and keeping yeah. going? Um, well, I suppose a big facet of any writer's life is rejection, you know, and it doesn't really either. It's kind of like official rejection. You know, you're told, no, we're not going to publish this book or the less official version where you never hear back from anybody. 
you know, and I, I am old enough to know the literal meaning of waiting by the phone. You know, we don't have to do that anymore. Luckily, the phone waits beside us wherever we go. Um, but it's, it's a hard part of the job, but there's a certain resilience that you need. Strong advice that if you really want to write, just keep on writing, regardless of whether you're getting a, a positive response or not. You must like what you do. You know, you must want to do it. And um, it's no guarantee that you will be published, but certainly just waiting to be discovered uh, is not to me the right way to go about it. You just actually have to immerse yourself in the writing life. Uh, and I know it can be tricky, um, but it is, you know, the boring fact of the writing life is that you sit by yourself for hours of the day and you just do it. You fill pages with words and you examine the words and you keep some and you reject others and you assemble and reassemble these sentences. And um, that's, and eventually you come to an ending of a story or a screenplay or a poem or whatever. But um, I don't have practical advice really in terms of, uh, you know, when I, my first novel was published, The Commitments, it, it was published because I published it myself. I was going way back to 1987. There was no um, option to publish online. You know, the, word, the, the term online didn't exist. Um, so uh, it was a physical book that I, uh, myself and a friend of mine here in Dublin, we published it ourselves. And um, that was an option. And it was a, a real option. You know, at this stage, all I wanted to do was to have a book in my hand, you know, that I'd written myself. And it looked as if I was never going to, you know, be published by um, any of the uh, official publishers, so to speak. So I did it myself. That was great. It was absolutely brilliant. You know, eventually I got the money back, but uh, I didn't really, I had a full-time job, so I didn't, you know, and I had a loan, a bank loan, and I was paying it back. And I'd, I'd, I'd got what I wanted, you know. I'd gone through the whole process of writing the book, then editing the book, having the book designed, publishing the book, launching the book. Um, and it was a great experience. It was an actually an, a brilliant experience and would have remained so regardless of it, if I'd ever been published again. But I suppose the point is when I finished the commitments and I was wondering, you know, will it ever see the light of day? And I was getting people to read it and asking people to read it and to see what would happen with it. I immediately started the next book. And I was writing The Snapper when eventually The Commitments was published first by myself and then in the UK a year later. And I was, I, I was writing the second book regardless of uh, whether the first one was published or not, because I really, I was dashing home from work at this stage, wanting to continue writing. It all worked out, so to speak. I ended up, you know, being published and being and having a publisher who I worked with up until very, very recently, right through the guts of 30 years. So I was lucky in that regard. But um, I think what made me lucky in a way was just the fact that the resilience, I suppose you'd call it, or the tenacity, I don't know, choose your own word, but you just have to put on the blinkers and decide this is what I want to do, you know, and um, despondency... Yeah, right. You know, uh, despondency is going to be quite useful insofar as, um, you know, you can write really good par paragraphs fueled by your despondency. You know, it can be an energy. Um, John Lydon, Johnny Rotten, in one of his songs, has a, a great line, anger is an energy, you know. Yeah. I remember when I heard that line the first time, it made so much sense. And strangely enough, despondency also is an energy, you know. Yeah. I think that's your answer, Kyla, is tenacity and sticking with it. And mm. like I'm 24 years writing seriously and I still get rejections and it's just yeah, part so of do I. life. Yeah, so do I. So it Roddy is, Doyle is. gets rejections. There you go. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't not end and it is a matter of sticking with it. But like yeah. do all the things you think you should do. Join a writer's group. Do your research. Who's mm -hmm. writing like you and who is their agent and approach that yeah. agent, you know, research. A sports person, a sport, sorry to cut across you, Nola, but a sports person I was listening to recently had a great notion. She said, you learn nothing from winning. You learn a lot from losing. Yeah. 
<laughs> doesn't make it easy, but it's true. No, but, you know, it, it actually, it makes losing a useful thing. Yeah. Because you learn, you know, certainly it might be easier to measure in a sport, but she certainly was saying that she learned from losing. Um, and people talk to her about losing, but not about winning, because people just want to celebrate when you win. So I think, you know, using the experience of rejection and, you know, just kind of using it, grist to the mill, so to speak, is a, if you can do that. Is, um, but rejection is a, it's a facet of the job, you know, and it's, it doesn't go away. Yeah, let, let, let it make you more determined. Here's a question from Fiona McIntosh. And hi, Fiona. She asks you, Roddy, who's the first person to read your work when you're ready for feedback? Do you have a reader or does it go to your editor and agent first? Or who do you send it to? Or I suppose to the you? person who reads it first is myself, first of all. You know, I, I'm, I'm a vital part of the process. I won't give it away unless I feel it's ready to go. And then uh, I've, my agent, Lucy Luck, is a brilliant reader. And uh, she reads really quickly and really, really well and closely without getting pernickety, you know, because um, so I actually have given unfinished work to Lucy in the knowledge that she knows how to read unfinished work. Some people don't know how to read, no matter how many times you'd say, oh, it's only a first draft. Don't you know that they, they don't know how, they don't know what that means. And that's fair enough. Um, but Lucy's a great, great reader. And um my 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 publisher and editor then is all that they would read it for emotional reasons then maybe a family member would read it you know but um very few people actually do read it but what do you mean by for emotional reasons now let's let's talk a bit about that do you um, mean it is i i actually hate handing over work i hate when it becomes even a little bit more public it's a very it's a very very difficult moment i've never felt elated when i finished a piece of work really I'm just relieved sometimes but never in any sense elated and i find it very hard handing it over um there's a part of me that would assume it's crap you know and i think for emotional reasons as i said i like that somebody very, very close to me would read it and not necessarily even comment on it or say, oh, it's brilliant or, you know, nothing like that. Just I'd prefer it that somebody who I love would just read it or even pretend to read it. It makes it, it makes the whole thing just a bit easier. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't like my stuff going out into the public either. I just, it's mm. like, it's too exposing or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, here's another question from Vanessa Sterling. And she asks, where do you start when you get into the editing phase? And when do you do that? Is uh, it after publication? Is it something you do throughout? Or is it something after you do? Think you it depends on what I'm working on, really. You know, if it's a novel, I tend to, you know, let it go. Just not by when, when I start, I measure quantity first. You know, mm. if I can get a thousand words a day done at the beginning, I'm really happy with that because you're getting to know the characters, you're getting to know what's going on. You know, that you might go up to work one day and you discover, oh, Jesus, he's just met somebody. I hadn't anticipated that. This could go on, you know, for months. And I allow that to happen. And I'm not too fussy about the. Is it overwritten? Have I missed out something here? Does it make sense? I just keep on at it. Then after that initial phase, it's a bit like meeting somebody new, you know, that you kind of semi fall in love with them somehow or other. You know, they're great crack. They're great fun. You look forward to meeting them. And then you realize, oh, they're only human, you know. And uh, I think, oh, they want to meet me. I'm, I might push put that till next week. I like them, but, you know, I might just push, you know, so they become human and you calm down. And that's the time, I think, when I go back and I start looking at what I have. And sometimes you might run out of steam a bit and I go back and I start looking and maybe. But I think if I had, say, for example, 10,000 words done and it, it's a book that I anticipate is going to be a good deal longer than that. If I start chipping away at those 10,000 words, it, it's probably too early. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like progress when you go up to work one day with 10,000 words and you come down at the end of the day with 7,000. It's very hard to feel that it's a good day's work, unless maybe it's a short story. That's a different job. 
So I tend to go for quality, quantity, 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 and the knowledge that eventually quality, you know, if you like, if, if it's quantity, quality, and eventually it'll flip the other way. And if I write enough words, then I'm quite happy to go at it with the proverbial red ballpoint pen and, you know, hack away at it then. But I wouldn't be happy handing over a piece of work unless I thought it was really well carefully edited. But there are different phases of editing, as you know yourself. There's the kind of line by line editing and then there's the broader editing, you know, and, I, you know, I've sometimes I've literally printed out the work and put it on the floor and tried to organize it in such a way that, you know, is chapter one actually chapter one and is chapter three chapter three or is there a yawning hole there that hasn't been filled without giving away too much and does this make sense or is this something that really I just went off on a tangent and it shouldn't be there or I'll just put it to the side for a minute and I tried to organize the thing in a bigger way you know sometimes it's a straight line and my early novels in particular the first three were really a straight line you know from beginning to end then they become a bit more complicated later on and Finding a proper structure for a book like, say, The Woman Who Walked Into Doors, that was a, a tricky one, finding the structure for that. And um, Paddy Clark, ha, 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 uh, my fourth novel, that the structure of that, I didn't know what the structure of that was when I finished the book. And finding the structure among the words that I'd already written was a really tricky job, you know, really, really um I knew finally what he was, what was happening in his life, but trying to make sure that the structure of the book uh, reflected what was going on in his life or, you know, or uh, followed the pattern that I felt was going on in his life. That was really quite hard. And it, I spent quite literally quite a lot of time on the floor organizing pages, you know, the desk, there's not enough, there wasn't enough room on the desk. It had to be the floor. Yeah, it's interesting, that thing about structure and the way academics will come at the thing and, you know, talk about it in different ways. Um, there's a few anonymous questions here. Can you talk about your writing practice and how the pandemic changed it? Writers are solitary always during the pandemic. Everyone was home. Yeah, well, the pandemic didn't change my writing pattern at all because, you know, I work. I work from home. I, well, I don't work from home. I work at home. And uh, I have been doing that since I gave up high school teaching in 1993. So it's not far from 30 years I've been working in the house that I live in. Yeah. And that didn't change, really. In some ways, it did change, of course, because, you know, uh, I work from choice in the house. But then during the pandemic, I didn't have any choice. So I now, uh, for example, a big change is that I have an office in the city centre. For the first oh. time, I have an office outside my home, and that's deliberate to get out of the house and to, you know, I, 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 as, as soon as I possibly could, when we were allowed to go further than two kilometres and we were allowed to go five, five kilometres, I started walking. In. I, I'm Luckily, I'm about four kilometres from the city centre, and I started walking into the city centre. And look, sometimes I was the only person on a street, which is an eerie feeling in the middle of the day, really, really. Yeah. Um, and strangely more chilling sometimes than it would have been at midnight or three in the morning, you know, this, you know, what's the story? How come there's nobody else here? And then you'd find streets where there were quite a lot of people and you'd be wondering, what's the story here? Why are there people here? So um, I found I started using this office some months ago and just uh, getting on the bus, going into the city centre, seeing how it's gradually waking up again, you know, but there's dereliction it's quite desolate in places. Yeah. A couple of pubs I really liked. I don't, they're not going to open again. Cafes. I still sit, I can sit in the cafe sometimes, say today, Tuesday, middle of the morning, having a cup of coffee, and I'm the only person in the cafe, which is bizarre. You know, Sunday, I was working on a Sunday some weeks ago, and town was absolutely packed. But the working day, when normally it would be packed, it's not. So yeah. things are happening. And I, I like the notion that I'm out there uh, looking at it, not making, not taking notes or not making any wise observations, but just kind of 
uh, taking it in, so, uh, so to speak, you know. Um, it's a new present day, so to speak. And I, um, so the pandemic has sort of shoved me out of the house, really, in a way that I wouldn't have anticipated. But my work and practice hasn't really changed. I work less hours from choice because I, I began to realize that I really can pack a lot into an hour. I'm very disciplined. I'm really, really very disciplined when it comes to writing. And I don't want to work eight hours a day anymore, you know. Yeah. Yeah, when I have to. And I do, at the moment, I'm doing a piece of work where I have to. But I don't want to do it because that's what I do anymore. I don't really need to. So, um, but I do. Uh, so, you know, I, during the course of those two years, ironically, seeing as there wasn't much else to do, I started working less, really. Yeah. I, I, I love working less in terms, in terms of measuring hours. Yeah. I think it's I love the idea of you getting the bus to go into town to write. <laughs> it's just <laughs> something very lovely about that. Listen, Roddy, we're out of time and thanks a million. It's been a pleasure. To oh, talk. Thank you. It was really, I really enjoyed it. Nola. Thanks very, very much. I'm so sorry to cut this conversation short. I think I speak for everybody when I say I wish we had another hour. But of course, it is much later in Ireland and it I'm is. sure you are ready to go to bed. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. These are these are my pajamas, by the way. <laughs> they're, they're well disguised. <laughs> thank you again, everyone, um, for joining us this evening. Your patronage is what allows politics and prose to put on such lovely conversations um, like this. As a gentle reminder, I've put the book link um, to purchase Life Without Children stories in the chat. It'll take you to the politics and prose website where after you purchase your copy, I hope you'll visit our events page. We'd love to see you at another event soon. In the meantime, stay well, everyone, and well read. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you, Nula. Thank you. Thank you Thanks Phil. very much. Thanks, Thanks Nula. Everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Chelsea. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.